The year was 1987. I had just bought my first synthesizer ever, the Korg Poly 6. Well, not this exact Poly 6, but one just like it. This one is definitely in need of some attention and restoration. And this video series, we are going to be restoring this synthesizer, fixing everything that doesn't work in it and making it better than new. Coming up next. The year was 1987, I was 18 years old. I went to Long McQuaid Music Store in Toronto. I had saved up some money. I wanted to buy an Ensonic Mirage. It was the late 80s. Nobody wanted an old analog synth. The world was now digital. DX7 samplers, the D50, you know, the whole synthesizer world was changing to digital. Analog was passe. So I went there to go buy a Mirage. While I was waiting for the salesman, I started playing around on the various synthesizers and I, one of those synthesizers was this sad old Poly 6 that was sitting there. It actually sat, it actually had a sold sign on it. And I started playing with the different presets and one of the presets that it had in it was the lead sound from Living On Video by Trans X. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, my God, I have to have this synthesizer because of that sound. So I went to the salesman, I said, it says it's sold, but can you make me a deal if I buy the Mirage and the Poly 6? And he did. I didn't have enough money to pay for both of those. So of course I signed my life away on payments, just like every other musician ever does. And Long and McQuaid owned my soul for a number of years after that, but I did eventually pay all that off and start all down the path of buying synthesizers. I did buy both, but I didn't have a car at the time. I had wrecked yet another car, so I had to travel on the bus. I can only carry one synthesizer at a time, so I took the Tolly 6 home, and yes, I carried this home on the bus. Well, again, not this one, but one just like it. All the way home, so yes, this was, even though I bought two synthesizers that day, the Poly 6 is the first one that came home with me, so the Poly 6 was my very first synthesizer. I bought it along with an A-frame that I had for, oh, probably 20, 25 years. The next day I went back and picked up the Mirage, so technically I guess that was my second synthesizer. So I used that synthesizer for years and years. Ten years later, uh, the Poly 6 was not really in good shape anymore. A lot of the buttons didn't work. It wouldn't stay in or play in tune. Uh, I took it apart. I replaced every button in it. I replaced a bunch of the pots. Uh, I replaced the leaking battery. I, I fixed circuit boards. I, I did a lot of work to it and got it working perfectly again. And then I didn't use it. A few years later, 2001, I believe, uh, it had been sitting there unused since I fixed it. Again, uh, 2001, nobody wanted or used analog synthesizers. You could buy Jupiter 8s for next to nothing. SH-101s like I got up there, you could buy them for 50 bucks. Synthesizers that today cost thousands of dollars were going for nothing. And I sold my Poly 6. I sold my Poly 6 for a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. Don't even get me started on how much I sold some of my other old synths for back then. So what about the Poly 6? The Poly 6 was actually released by Korg in 1981, about the same time that uh, Roland brought out the Juno 6. Korg's idea behind this was to bring out a polyphonic synthesizer that was affordable because up until then, polyphonic synthesizers were thousands and thousands of dollars. They were the cost of, of a new car or more. The Poly 6 came out in 1981 for $1,000, which was unheard of. Before then, if you wanted a polyphonic synth, you were looking at a Prophet 5 or an OBXA or a Jupiter 8, and they were not cheap. Korg made 50,000 of these, so it was definitely a success. There were many, many of these being used on records and, and live shows all over the world. As the name would suggest, it's a six voice polyphonic synthesizer, standard subtractive synthesis analog synthesizer. Each voice has its own oscillator and a sub oscillator. The main oscillator can be changed from a sawtooth or a, a pulse wave with pulse width modulation waveforms. As well, there's a sub oscillator, which is again, another pulse oscillator. The filter is a 24 decibel per octave four pole resonant filter, 
very sharp cutoff, but it's a warm sounding analog filter. And in fact, the filter in this synthesizer is so well loved that Korg developed an emulation of the Poly6 filter and it is included in all their digital uh, synthesizers today. The Wave State, the Op6, the Mod Wave, uh, the Nautilus, they all have a Poly6 filter emulation in them. The filter based on SSM chips can be pushed into self-resonance, which means you can generate a pure sine tone. And if you use the keyboard track properly on there, you can, you can actually use that to play the resonant portion of the filter as a tone, either by itself or on top of the existing tones and get a pure sine wave out of it. It has a standard ADSR envelope generator, VCA, and as well as a single LFO, which they call MG for modulation generator. You can adjust the frequency delay and level, and you can have that modulation apply to the VCA, VCF, or VCO. So the oscillator, amplitude, or the filter one of the above. You can't have it affecting more than one of those. Unlike many other synthesizers of the time, it does have effects. It has a chorus, phase, and an ensemble. You can change the speed and intensity. The chorus is obviously a mono chorus because it is not a stereo output. Uh, unlike the Juno 106 that has is a mono synth, but it has stereo effects after the fact. The effects here are mono. The ensemble is really the, the secret weapon of the Poly 6. It's kind of the equivalent of today's Super Saw, sort of. It, it gives it a really huge sound, uh, kind of like the, the Mellotron or the string machines of, of the 70s. And if the ensemble doesn't give you a huge enough sound, you can actually set it into unison mode where all six voices play at the same time. And of course they're analog, so there is a little bit of detuning between those voices, which just gives you a wide, fat analog sound. There is an arpeggiator. You can do one, two, or full range ar arpeggiator. You can do up, down, or up and down. You can also have it latch. It will play chords. So if you have a chord memorized in your chord memory here, the arpeggiator will actually play the chord up and down, which is a, a fairly advanced feature for a synth of this era. Now, unlike its competitor, the Roland Juno 6, which had no patch memory, the Cork Poly 6 has 32 patch memories. So you have four banks with eight patches per bank. You can store those on cassette. If you plug in a cassette recorder, you can, you can record your patches on a cassette and then play back from the cassette and load them. So you could have multiple tapes with all your different patches and you can simply stick the cassette in, hit load, and it'll, it'll load those 32 patches in. And there are people that did sound design. This is kind of the beginning of the sound design market where people would create uh, 32 patches and then sell cassettes with their patches on them that you could load into your Poly 6. Of course, the Poly 6 came out in 1981. MIDI came out in 1982, so there is no MIDI on the Poly 6. There's an external clock uh, gate that you can trigger the arpeggio off. I don't believe there is a CV in this. Arpeggio trigger, VCF, uh, no, there is not. So you are limited in what you can do in terms of controlling this externally. There's no velocity sensitivity on the key bed. It's simply on off and you have to create the dynamics using your VCF and VCA. Who used this back in the day? Oh, everybody used this. Tears for Fears, Alphaville, uh, Blamage, Jean-Michel Jarre used it, um, Keith Emerson, and, and today, even today, uh, bands like Zoot Woman, they still use the Poly 6 today. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this specific synthesizer. This Poly 6 actually has a bit of provenance. It was originally owned by Rude Van Steens of uh, Vis-a-Vis, Glamatron, um, Ghost Particles. He also worked with Rob Stewart in EDF. If you've heard Vis-a-Vis -vis tracks before, you have heard this Poly 6 playing on those tracks. This synthesizer went from Rude Van Steens to Rob Stewart of EDF and Slave to the Square Wave, and then from Rob it came to me. This synthesizer is in serious need of restoration. It is, um, it's in rough shape. The end cheeks on the Poly 6 are made of particle board, and as soon as it gets bumped around or dropped on the floor or bashed on the road, they just disintegrate. So that has happened to this one. It's been fixed by sticking some duct tape, uh, black duct tape, but uh, I mean, that looks terrible. 
The other problems that they have, the t these tactile buttons, they fail. They're, they're just old and they wear out. Uh, I replaced these on my old Poly 6. I'm gonna replace them on this one as well. The main problem with Poly 6s is the main processor board that's sitting right in here. This, this synthesizer needs to have memory in order to store all the patches. And back then, there was no such thing as flash RAM, so they just had static RAM that could be maintained with a constant voltage. So they put a tiny little NICAD battery on the main circuit board, on the main CPU board. That battery kept that RAM powered, so when you turned it off, you didn't lose your patches. Every time you turned it on, it would recharge that battery. The problem is that over the years, that NICAD battery leaks, and it leaks this horribly noxious acid all over that circuit board, and it eats away at the traces and absolutely decimates that circuit board. And when that starts to happen, I mean, it's the main CPU board that runs the entire thing. It runs the scanning for the key bed. It runs the scanning for all the controls. It does all the patch selection. All that functionality goes away. So basically it destroys the synthesizer. This happened on my synthesizer. I caught it fairly early. I took that battery off, replaced it with a lithium cell, and then I went into all the individual traces that had been affected by the acid, and I fixed them by, by doing point-to-point -point wiring using wire wrap and solder. Uh, the problem is it doesn't really fix it because once that, that acid starts getting out onto that board, it really migrates and it just, it, it corrodes everything and it's not immediately obvious as to which traces have failed. It really makes a mess of that board. So this synthesizer has never had that battery fixed. It's leaking all over. The board is just ruined. So that's something we're gonna have to deal with. Now the, the power supply in this is an old style linear power supply. There's a great big transformer and then it feeds into the linear power supply that supplies all the different rail voltages that run the rest of the synthesizer. The problem with it is that when the power supply fails, and I say when, not if, when it does fail, it fails in a way that sends huge voltages throughout the rest of the synthesizer and you basically smoke the entire synthesizer. Every board just gets cooked and you've now got a doorstop that can't be fixed. And for that reason, I have not turned on this synthesizer since I got it because I'm afraid that in doing so, I would just cook it and let all the smoke out of the various circuit boards. Really don't wanna do that. So what am I gonna do? Fortunately, there are aftermarket upgrades for this. One of them is a power supply upgrade from Kiwi Technics in New Zealand and it replaces that power supply board with a brand new one with better components and designed in a way that if it were to fail, it fails shorted so that no voltage gets through to the board instead of full voltage getting through to the boards. Kiwi Technics also makes a replacement circuit board that replaces that main CPU board that gets destroyed by the battery acid. So we're gonna pull that board out, get rid of it, and replace it with the Kiwi Technics Kiwi 6 board. Now, just like when I did my SH-101 with the Tubatech upgrade, the Kiwi 6 board gives you a lot more capabilities. And I've written them down here because otherwise I'll never remember what they are. So instead of 32 patches, you get 512 patches. And because it uses modern flash memory, no more batteries are needed. There's no, uh, no way you can actually lose your memory because a, a lithium battery has run out or you aren't gonna have battery leakage or anything of that sort. You also get MIDI, yes. So you get a MIDI in and a MIDI out that brings this synthesizer into the 1980s with a full MIDI capability. And with that MIDI capability, all the controls are addressable via SysX or uh, CC. You can either Nerpin or CC. A lot of the controls such as uh, you know filter and so on um, that have potentiometers that are analog, instead of using this standard 0 to 127 7-bit MIDI, it actually uses NERPIN so you have 1,024 bits of, uh, of, not bits, 1,024 steps of resolution when sending and receiving MIDI data for those controls. Actually, no, it's not 1,024, it's 4,096, I got that wrong. So it's 4,096 steps which means that instead of stepping when you are adjusting your filter, you won't hear those steps. It's a nice smooth transition. 
you get a far more flexible arpeggiator and the arpeggiator setting is saved as part of the patch. So if you have a patch that you've designed that really needs that arpeggiator, it that the status and, and settings for that arpeggiator are saved as part of the patch. You get a sequencer, a polyphonic sequencer with eight different sequences that you can store. Each, each of those eight sequences has 124 notes and they can be chords. So if you wanna play 124 chords into the sequencer, it will record that. Uh, those are eight for the entire synthesizer. You don't get individual sequences attached to patches, which would have been nice, but that's not how it works. So you get eight different sequences that you can switch between, between, and I believe you can chain them and that sort of thing as well. But the fact that there is no sequencer in here at all means that by getting one, you, you, you get something extra that you didn't have already. Because we have MIDI, that means we also have a MIDI clock. We can synchronize the sequencer and the arpeggiator to that MIDI clock. There is an internal MIDI clock or you can actually sync it to an external MIDI clock. So if you have a DAW or a sequencer or something that's sending MIDI here, it will sync the sequencer and the arpeggiator to that MIDI clock and allow you to play, keep this thing in time with anything else you have. This can also act as a master MIDI clock. So if you wanna use the sequencer in this to play something and then you wanna have another synthesizer sync to that, it will work that way as well. The, the Poly 6 has a built-in power cord on the back that is permanently attached to the synthesizer. The Kiwi 6 upgrade comes with a standard IEC socket, so you can just plug in any power cord and replace it if it gets damaged. There are also quite a few modifications during the installation of the Kiwi, Poly, uh, the Kiwi 6 upgrade that reduce the noise of the Poly 6. Now, the Poly 6 is known for being a little bit noisy. You get a lot of digital hash from the keybed scanning circuitry, uh, a lot of noise from the effects, um, and then just general noise from poor shielding and poor grounding inside it. So as part of the Kiwi 6 upgrade, you get a lot of grounding and, and, and modifications that reduce the overall noise. I'm also going to replace the transformer with a toroidal transformer that is far more efficient and rejects noise a lot better. I'm also going to put some protective capacitors on the input to also knock out some of the noise. And lastly, the Kiwi 6 upgrade comes with some ferrite chokes to put on the scanning lines and things so that we can reduce the EMI inside, all in the, the name of reducing the noise floor of the Poly 6 to making it sound that much better. There's two unknowns about this. One is the rubber contacts that work the keyboard, the keys, just like most synthesizers, the piece of plastic comes down, pushes a rubber cap against a contact on a circuit board. They fail because they get dirty. So because I haven't had this turned on yet, I don't know if all the keys are working. If there is a problem with that, I'll try cleaning it. If that doesn't do it, I'll order some rubber caps and we'll just replace all that stuff in the key bed and, and get it working as new. The other problem that, that affects these Poly 6s a lot is there's an optocoupler used in the divide down circuitry for the tuning. When it fails, it fails in a way that makes it so either you, you can't play different notes or you can't get the thing to play in tune at all. Uh, again, obviously I don't know if that's happened to this one, but if it has, then we'll, we'll fix that. And lastly, the case itself. We have this awful duct tape on the side and the case is pretty beat up. It, and it, it, the whole case is a really cheap particle board that Korg tried to spend as little as possible to try to get the, the price down on this thing. Fortunately, there is a really talented gentleman on Reverb that makes replacement solid walnut hand-built stained gorgeous cases for these types of synthesizers. He makes them for a bunch of different ones. I'll put a link to it in the description below. And I have bought one of those. We'll be taking all of the guts and the key bed and the top part off of this, get rid of the old wooden case here with its duct tape cheek and cheeks, and we'll be installing it in this gorgeous walnut case that, I, that I've ordered. He makes them to order, so when you order it, you can if you want something special, he'll definitely take care of that for you. So that's it, that's the Korg Poly 6 that is the new restoration project. Next step is to take this apart and transfer everything across into that new case. 
I hope you'll come back and please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of these videos. Click subscribe and then that little bell down below. It lets you get notified whenever we post one of these so you won't miss out on this series of the restoration of the Poly 6. If you do like what you saw, please click like. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, anything you want to let me know, something I might have missed out about or should know about the Poly 6, please leave it in the comments below. This is going to be a fun one. Thanks for watching.